But I'm going to give you one more today, and it's one that sometimes will help visual people. And uh, I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to give you a chance to do it with one another. Thus the napkin. Are you ready? This is often called the bridge illustration. And so what you would do when you're sitting there at Chick-fil-A with your buddy, hanging out at Starbucks with a friend, I don't know where you might be, but uh, you're sitting there and you kind of hang out like this. You just say, let me just show you and explain to you this story that I'm in the middle of with you. Okay? Over here, you've got man. And if you're a gifted artist like me, you can throw down some great art. (laughs) There you are. Okay? And then over here, you know, you got God. And the scripture says in Isaiah, if you want, chapter 59 Verse 2, it says that your sins have separated you from God. In other words, God's holy, you're not, so there's this eternal chasm that is fixed right there. Now, here's the deal. I like to sometimes ask folks just simple questions like, hey, are you at a point in your spiritual life where if you die tonight, you know you'd go to heaven? And and I love, folks sometimes go, "Mm, I hope so. And so I love to ask on a scale from 1 to 10, how sure are you? If you die tonight, you know you'd, you'd go to heaven. And they go, mm, and they usually like to be humble. And so they'll say, seven, eight on a good day. I go, that's great. I go, so just out of curiosity, if you stood before the Lord, I don't believe this conversation will take place, but if you stood before the Lord and he said to you, why should I let you in? What would you say? And almost 90% of the people that you talk to will say this. Well, I'll say that, you know, I'm not the best guy, the best gal in the world, but I mean, by and large, I've tried to live a moral life. It's been pleasing and responding to his word, and I've done the best that I could. And so I say, great. So your answer would basically be along the lines of that, that your works, though you know they're not perfect because you're a humble person, that your works are hopefully going to be more to the good than the bad, and God surely grades on some level of a curve, and you're hoping you're better than Dahmer and Hitler, so to say. <laughs> who clearly have washed out. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's a, okay, great. So uh, let's establish that. And then I, I just like to say this. Okay, well, here's the deal. Let's just talk about what the Bible does say. And so what I'll write down over here is something like this. The Bible says, and we've already covered this if, if you've been on the Romans road, you know, you just say, look, all have sinned. And so we know that. This is, the true, this is what's true of life with man. That's Romans Right? 3.23. The Bible also says the wages of that sin is death. And we know that because we looked at Romans 6.23. Now we also know this. The Bible says that it's appointed for man to die and after this comes judgment. It's a verse I haven't taught you till now, but you guys know that judgment is coming because I'm going to tell you that it says that among other places... Let's just say Hebrews 9, 27. So this is life with man. Sinners, the wage of sin is death, and judgment is coming. Now here's the deal. Let me show you what's so great about God. This is life with God. This is John 5, 24. I like to maybe just put this over here. One of many verses that teaches this truth. John 5, 24 says this. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word... And believes him who sent me has eternal life. And so over here, we're going to put down life. And it says, and does not come into judgment. So over here, we're going to write down no judgment. But is passed out of death, so no death into life. That's John 5, 24. So life with God, watch this. Life with God deals with sin and death. And life with God deals with judgment. And so the question is, how do we deal with our sin? So now we're getting somewhere. And so what you want to say to somebody is this. A lot of folks, they kind of say, I'm going to just do the best I can for as long as I can. And, and, And so what they'll do is they'll say, you know, I'm going to go to church. Or I'm going to read my Bible. Or I'm going to give to the poor. You know, I'm going to be a faithful guy. And then I go, okay, now look. Here's the thing. Is that God says this chasm. Is huge. He uses the word as an eternal separation. And so there's lots of different illustrations you use for this. And just say, look, um, let's just say that heaven, you know, where God is, is like the North Pole. Okay? And if we picked up a rock and we want to fire that rock to the North Pole, you know, different athletes could get that rock a lot closer than others, right? I mean, I might be able to throw that rock a lot further than you, but at the end of the day, even though I could get, you know, this far, 
All right? There is no way I could ever make it to the North Pole. So some people, you know, they throw it that way, they do it this way. But that chasm, man, you can never cross through your own efforts. This is what the scripture says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Okay, you want to put that right here? All right? And that says, a little hyphen there, it just says, for by grace we have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not as a result of works, so that no man should boast. The scripture says you can never make yourself fit for God. There's one scripture that says your best deeds are like filthy rags in the book of Isaiah. So God says you're going to fall short. Your rock doesn't quite make it to where it needs to go to merit acceptance from God. So what do we do? And by the way, I like to sometimes ask folks, hey, if you had to put an X right now, where is your life? Are you with God, okay, or are you with man? And I let them put an X right where they think they are. And then I remind them, hey, you say you're over here with God, but remember when I asked you why you thought you were with God, you gave me these answers, works, church, goodness, kindness. Some people go, well, I sincerely believe that, that what you're saying isn't true. I go, well, wait a minute. Let's talk about sincerity. Because sincerity is something that people think will get them across too. And all I would say to sincerity is this. A person's sincerity of belief is not what determines truth, is it? In other words, you can believe something sincerely is true, but your sincerity is not what makes it true or false. What makes it true or false is, is it true? Example, there's some people that have sincerely believed that there's a little guy in a red suit with a white beard that makes their way around the earth on certain events of the calendar where they jump down chimneys and they lead pleasant gifts behind. In fact, they've been told that by people they love, trust, and respect. And that this, this belief has pervaded itself through generations of cultures. And I sincerely believe that is true. And I would just say, okay, great. It's wonderful that you sincerely believe that. But your belief in it isn't what makes it true. What makes something true is not your belief, but the fact that it's true. Similarly, you may not believe that that frozen lake, if you walked across it, would get you to the other side. But you don't need to believe it, whether or not it is. I could throw you down, and I could walk across it and drag you across, and though you don't believe that ice could hold us, your lack of belief doesn't change the fact that that ice is sufficient to get you across that frozen lake. So your belief is not what creates reality. Reality is what creates reality. What you need to understand is, is this what the Scripture says? Now, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. All right? What we do is this is what the Bible says is the way to cross that bridge. The Bible says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. You can maybe put that in right there. Okay? I'll give you some other verses if you're inclined to look other places. Some people like 1 Peter 3.18 but I'm going to keep it really simple for you this morning, all right? Let's just stick with John 5, 24. Because John 5, 24 says, the way you get from here to here, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, that he who hears my word, but that's half of it, and so today you have heard this. He who hears my word, and what? Believes. Him who sent me has eternal life. And so, friend, let me ask you a question. This is God's provision for you. You've heard it. Have you believed in it? And having believed, the scripture says, what that means is that you are going to say, I'm not trusting in my works, my beliefs. I'm trusting in what God has made evident through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, that this is the means to which I can be reconciled to him. See, this is the bridge illustration. That which gets you across is the cross of Jesus Christ. And what you've got to do, though, today is put your trust in that Jesus. And you've got to say, Lord, I believe that that's the means to which I can be reconciled to you. And so I put my trust in Christ alone. 